See, look at, even with nitro flowing through there, we've still got a flame out. This video is brought to you by Sportland. Quality, integrity, and tradition. All right, we have a large four-door bar cooler. It stops right there. So uh, they're saying that it's not working. Uh, the temp control says 49 degrees. I do not see any ice on the evaporator coil up there that I can see, but I gotta pull the cover off to really get behind it. Um, fan motors are all working. Compressor's running. I've got some service gauges on here. Uh, it's about 11 PSI on the low side and about 30 PSI on the high side. I'm sorry, uh, 130 PSI on the high side. This is R290. Um, you can see because they have flammable things right here. Uh, I went ahead and opened up Measure Quick, uh, inputted the numbers into there because I don't have digital probes on there. I think it says my saturation for the low side is negative 11. My saturation for the high side, if I remember right, is 89 degrees. It's currently 70 degrees in the bar. Um, I mean, this isn't horrible, but the low side saturation is a little too low. It should be a little bit higher than that for sure. Uh, this is a TXV system. I don't see anything going in here. So what I did before I even logged this, put my service ports on there was I ran the electronic leak detector. I have the Inficon gas made. I ran it over the condenser before I even put service gauges on there and over the evaporator and nothing came up as a big leak. But clearly we're low on our low side pressure right there. Um, saturation temp of negative 11, that's way too low. So I need to open up the evaporator coil. We're gonna shut it off. Um, now in this unit, that's not the permanent shutoff, but the temp control is the brain. So the evaporator fan motor turns off. Now there's still a booster fan running. That's just from the light circuit. I got to pull this keg out and we got to get behind that coil and we're going to look for a leak behind the coil. This is a glass tender box. Um, back in here, there is ice. There's a big old ball on the TXV. So I bet you it's going to be a low charge. You see that blue corrosion looking stuff right there contaminants and then storing things in here so I need to get that ice melted I'm gonna go get my pump sprayer get the ice melted really quick and once we get that melted I bet you that we'll find a leak on the TXV these things are notorious for that it's turning out to be more ice than I thought it goes quite back behind that coil and up into there it's hard to see but there's a giant ball I stuck my hand back there and it's kind of on the coil so this is why it's so important that you don't just add refrigerant to something because you really need to get in there and make sure that it's iced up. Now I put my gauges on there and it looked like it was low on charge, but you always, that's why I said, I'm gonna get into the evaporator and have a look at it. You always gotta look at the evaporators and see if they're iced up, if they're dirty, restricted, and what's going on. I still think we're gonna be low on charge, but we'll find out more once I get it all defrosted and then we'll evaluate the pressures after that. Things are escalating over here. I ended up having to uh, pull that off so I can get back behind there even more because it's just a giant chunk of ice back behind the coil. So, just a little bit out of time, just using the pump sprayer, but it's just taking a little more time than I wanted it to, but it is what it is. All right, got all the ice melted. Now we're gonna take the leak detector and go around the TXV. See if we pick anything up. Okay, let it zero out. Sometimes you get false alarms with this gas, mate. Let's go over here. Ooh, it's really setting off over there. Okay, so now let's see. Let's let it zero out. Sometimes you got to pull it out of the box to let it zero out in a clean area, and then let's check the coil now. It may be just so saturated with refrigerant. Nothing under that side of the coil. Now let's go over to this side. Not really picking anything up in the coil. It's just all around the TXV. These things are notorious for having leaking TXVs. All right, I don't know if that's it. We're going to get some soap bubbles, the big blue, and we're going to see if we can pinpoint this little one. When you're using big blue, it's a micro leak detector. If you spray it as a steady stream, you get little bubbles like that. Perfect. So it is leaking on the TXV. Unfortunately, that is a very difficult TXV to weld on, and we're not really going to be able to make a patch. We need to replace the TXV. That is a uh, stainless steel TXV but it's copper coated on the inside so there's a different process of brazing it but filling it after the fact is really difficult and sometimes you can but it honestly it's not something I really want to tackle 
So we're gonna have to order a new TXV for them. All right, I went ahead and ordered the part next day air, early AM delivery, we'll have it tomorrow. Looking at that, I started thinking, it looks like it's been welded on before. And I looked up in the show notes or in the history, work order history, and yeah, that is correct. This has been repaired, uh, emergency repair before, and clearly it didn't hold. And judging by the look of it, it's, it's never really gonna hold. You need to change those things when they leak. So parts are ordered. Now the other thing is, is I have to vent a charge because moving it around, it started leaking more and it's leaking inside the box and you have all these electrical motors and it'll be sealed up. So I need to vent the charge out here that way there's no stored refrigerant in there leaking out, filling up this space when you have all these electric motors running in here and stuff. This is the stuff you gotta think about. This is flammable, non-odorized propane. You know, you can't be having it leaking and you can't have an operating unit, you know, with electrical parts and stuff running inside of it. The more I think about it, I'm not gonna leave this guy running with the fan motors either. So we're just slowly gonna vent the charge carefully. Nothing's plugged in. This guy's not plugged in right here. Just slowly venting it. We're gonna get it to atmosphere. I'm gonna stop when it saturates it, the area, let it dissipate for a minute, then we'll start again. We're gonna vent the whole charge. Um, I am gonna permanently disable the unit. I'm gonna hide the plug, tape it up so they can't plug it back in. I've already ordered the part, early AM, delivery tomorrow, next day air. So the delivery is more than the part, but they need it. So this is what we gotta do sometimes. For me, it's about liability and I can't be liable for this box leaking while I'm gone and waiting for parts. We don't want something bad to happen because once insurance companies get involved, you know, people's um, relationships and friendships and different things like that don't mean anything. It's the insurance companies trying to cover their butts. If an explosion happened on this unit, which is very, very rare that it would ever happen, but if it did, it would be my insurance company against the manufacturers and the restaurant's insurance company and I would have no say in anything. So. I gotta do what I feel to be the safest thing. So that was for me to vent the charge. There's no refrigerant left in there. And uh, permanently shut down the unit until we get the replacement parts. All right, we are back today. Looks like I have the right part, so I'm getting it assembled so I can verify everything's good. And hopefully get that guy replaced. Shouldn't be too difficult. Just a little tight in here, that's all. But they got all the kegs removed today, so that's cool, a little more room to work. All right, one of the most important things when you're doing an R290 repair is what makes the job safe is to sweep the system with nitrogen, okay? So what we're gonna do is I've got nitrogen, we're flowing through the high side, we're coming out the low side, right there. We're just doing a sweep, trying to get any refrigerant vapor out of the system, so that way any of the flammable vapors, so that way in theory we can braze without having any flames, okay? Um, so it's very important that you sweep with nitro before you do any repairs. Now we're going to try to cut out components, but being that it's so tight in here, you're not going to cut that dryer out. Like, so you're just going to have to unsweat it. So you got to think about that stuff as you're doing it. All right, it's going to be pretty tight in here. Got the new TXV itty bitty little one. So we're good. We got to get this guy cut out and then uh, sweat back in. They're using 5 sixteenths on this line right here. That sucks. Really tight working in here, so. just got to do your best and think about the best way to do this paying attention to the fact that there's 5 16 my original thought was that I was going to extend the connection on the left but I don't have 5 16 line which 
I should probably get some, but supply houses don't have it, so they'd have to special order it for me. Wouldn't be a bad idea because with all the R290 equipment, 5 16 copper is becoming more and more popular because they need the smallest internal volume. They don't want any overages on that. So. There we go. That works. Now I could get this guy out. If you can score and break the copper, it'll give you a bigger opening because when you cut it all the way with the tubing cutter, it can uh, pinch down the pipe quite a bit. Cork tape. I hate cork tape. It's all sticky and difficult to get off. I hate this stuff. My freaking knuckles all bleeding now. Son of a gun, that's gonna be annoying. Leave that out of the way for now. We'll have to deal with that in a bit. Ah, frustrating. course they put the screw on the other side so I can't get to it what were they thinking here I can't even undo it what the heck well, that's just dumb they straight put the screw for the sensing bulb on the other side like what were they thinking And on top of that, it's a Torx or a flathead. You have to use one or the other, and I only have a flathead in my bag. I got Torx in the van, but I don't, I'm lazy. I didn't want to have to cut it, but you guys don't give me much choice. Again, I have tin snips in the van, but I'm just lazy. dang flathead or a Torx. Well, that stinks. On this TXV, the section that I cut out, it was swaged to go up to 3 8 This is a 3 8 TXV. This is 5 16 so it doesn't fit on there. Urgh, frustrating. All right, I got a quarter inch 5 16 bushing. At least I thought I did. No, I don't. Dang it. All right, what I ended up doing was taking a piece of five, uh, 3 8 copper, because it's 3 8 on the TXV, and slightly swaging it. Starting the process of swaging just enough to where it slides over the 5 16 so We'll braise that right there. Then we got a nice extension piece and then we'll secure the sensing bulb and everything when we're done. So I'm gonna get the TXV all wrapped up with uh, the Viper wet rag heat blocking compound to protect it. And we're gonna get in here and braze this guy in. Now brazing this is a little tricky because it's stainless steel, um, but it's copper coated on the inside. So you have two choices. You either silver solder it 
or you um, braise it with 15, which is the way it was designed to work, was braising it with 15. So, uh, um, I mean, the easiest thing is going to be to do to braise it with silver solder, but the problem with that is, is my other technicians might not know that it's silver solder when they go to change the TXV again. So, you got to think, like, everybody knows that these things are 15%, but, man, I'd hate to do this with 15%. Like, silver solder, I can guarantee we won't have any problems. Tricky, tricky. Decisions, decisions. So we are going to silver it. Fire going on. Alright, I've got the Viper Wet Rag heat blocking compound and I have the uh, heat shield, the Viper heat shield on here too to protect it. So I'm going to do this one in 15%. time for the 56% to shine. Okay. These are not the easiest braze joints because it's getting hot and it's tight. Okay, so that heat shield's kicking ass, not letting everything burn. Okay, okay, just gotta inspect my braze joints, cool that guy off, and hope to be done. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. Get that wet towel on those guys. Cool off. Boy, I'm glad this isn't under warranty. When they're warranty, they're a pain in the butt because they never pay enough money. It's annoying. This is out of warranty, so it's all time and materials. Clean off all the flex. And inspect it one more time. Looks like it took to me. Again, that one looks good. All right, let's move on. This thing's dumb. This strap is the dumbest strap ever. Like, I'm screw that. I went ahead and grabbed a Parker Sporlin strap, one of these right here. These things work. The other one's dumb. So I'm going to insulate it real quick. Boy, was that a pain in the butt, but we're in. We're good. Time to start getting all the dryer, cleaning up all my messes and everything. My goodness, I really had to work to get that condensing unit out, cutting zip ties and everything, and then got it twisted around so I can kind of get to that dryer because it's in an awkward spot. we got to get that changed out without burning everything up. Also need to replace these process stubs and get rid of the pinch points because those are potential leaks in the future. We're not going to be pinching this off when we're done. So, 
turn the nitro back on. See, look at, even with nitro flowing through there, we've still got a flame out. So that's why it's so important that we're making sure that flame out can still happen so you're always watching making sure you're not getting your hands in a place where it could potentially hurt you Cool this one off and then we can be flowing nitrogen through this one while we're dealing with the dryer as best as possible it's not going to be perfect Here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to undo this bottom one first, which is going to be tricky without burning everything down. Pull it up. Try not to melt anything. You guys scream at me if you see something catch on fire. Okay, let me know. It's kind of hard to see in this. Bozo heads make it so difficult to change a dang dryer. You want to be careful when you're cooling it that you don't let it touch because it'll uh, solder itself to it. Oh my gosh, that was ridiculously stupid how hard that was. Gosh darn it. That was insanely dumb. Again, I can't stress enough how much easier that would have been if this was a spoiling dryer. Now, why am I not going back in with the spoiling dryer? Because of how small the space is in here. I want to go back with the OEM stuff, make it easier. Still doesn't make it any smarter. Pretty dumb, if you ask me. But, you know, it's 
how it rolls. Cookie crumbles. Bend it down, so that way it's got downward pressure going into that. Give it some twists and it should. There we go. Okay, there we go, we're in. Now we just need to do this top piece right here. It's hot, probably shouldn't be touching it. Pretty darn hot on my hand. Okay. There we go. Now, let's see how much of this I can do without melting everything. It's gonna be silly. There's times when this heat blocking compound is just too, the dryers can be too small, you know? There's not a whole lot you can do right here. Wanna make sure you don't get it into the raising area. It's gonna burn no matter what. It's inevitable. I guess we're just reducing the amount of burning. Again, I'm not gonna fault this stuff for not protecting this. A lot of times people ask me why I don't protect things this small. It's because it's dang near impossible. You know? Extended connections on dryers should be a must all the time short ones especially on these little guys just plain stupid so it's not gonna be perfect but we're using the Viper wet rag heat blocking compound okay how much stuff am I gonna catch on fire doing this all right I gotta clean my torch it's driving me nuts okay we're still flowing with nitrogen here we go Let's see what we can do here how much stuff we can burn. the tricky one the bottom one I'm gonna have to I turn my torch up really high because we got to get in here and do this fast extra solder but like I say all the time I really don't care if I waste solder I'd rather not have a leak and have a little too much solder dripping off the joint that guy looks good all these guys look good let's go ahead and cool them off 
So that was a pain in the butt, but we were flowing nitro the whole time. It was a pain in the butt to get in there. We're gonna get all the wet rag and get it cooled off now, and then get the vacuum pump running on this guy. All right, uh, it's been holding at about 160 PSI. I pressurized it with nitrogen for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, something like that. I could have done the tightness test, but eh, it's no big deal. Um, I've just been watching it, so we're ready to uh, pull the evacuation on this guy. So I'm going to put core removal tools on here, and then we can pull the evacuation a little bit easier. So trying my best. Uh, we're pulling evacuation. It's at about 1,500 microns at the moment. Get the light to come on. So, and it's dropping. Um, I always, as I'm pulling my evacuation, kind of actuate these because there's little pockets of air sometimes behind them. So you want them to be kind of actuated. It'll help. Um, again, it's pulling down. I got R290 ready. Um, we need to change it to ounces. Yeah, so tear it. But obviously, we'll do that once we get going. So just uh, time to wait. Let it pull down. Such a small internal volume on this guy. Uh, using this large hose, it's kind of overkill because you're really restricted by the lines and stuff. But it's okay. It'll be done here in just a few minutes. All right, we're getting ready to charge this guy. Ball valved it off now. We got to make sure we purge right here to try to get any air out of the end of the line right here. So I just purged in here. Hopefully it dissipates some of that stuff. It's not going to be perfect. And then we'll have to purge this once we get going. So this guy, we need to tear it out. And I believe it was 4.4 ounces of refrigerant that is needed. I'll have to double check right now. Yeah, it's 4.41 ounces, which is kind of ridiculous, but... We're set to ounces. We're gonna go ahead and dump it in right now. We're dumping it in through the high side and it's flowing through, all right? Once we get to 4.4, we'll shut it off and then we'll open up the low side. So this is a Atlas scale from JB Industries, uh, DS5000, works great. Uh, I believe you can pick this up from True Tech Tools um, I'm almost positive that's where I got it from, truetechtools.com. Use my offer code BIGPICTURE, get an 8% discount on checkout, and then I get a small commission. Um, one tip on this scale, though, it comes with Schraders right here, and right here you need to take the Schraders out. The scale acts wonky when you're trying to push through the Schraders. So we're getting there, almost there. I'm going to turn it off for a sec, let it stabilize. 4.2. A little bit more 4.3 4.4 there we go that's it now what we're gonna do is go ahead and do this right here we're gonna loosen this guy oops not like that there we go right there right there purge so now we can start it up and uh, we'll be good to go we have enough refrigerant in there so what I'm gonna do is ball valve this off take this off and because we zeroed it with all this attached, that excess refrigerant that's going to be stuck in there after we shut it off is no big deal because we zeroed it out with everything in the hose full of refrigerant. Put on the uh, low side service port, get the condensing unit slid back in, get the evaporator put back together. I got to clean up some stuff and then we'll get this guy started up and hopefully be done with it. Before we get going too crazy, I'm going to do a leak search on all my braze joints. Again, using the Inficon gas mate. Nothing. This guy is a little bit sensitive to shaking and different things. Nothing. Let's go ahead and pop in here. I'll have to get in here with soap bubbles and see. It could just be leftover remnants of another thing. Let's try again. Yeah, I'll have to get in here and check. I don't think there's going to be a leak in there. I have to get my soap bubbles out. I got in here with soap bubbles. There's nothing. It's all sprayed. There's no leaks in there. I'll double check the coil again, but I think it was just residual crap in here. So I'm not too worried about it because we passed the pressure test and the evacuation test. Well, it's running. It's got refrigerant pressures. We have compression. Now, I don't have it completely put together yet. I wanted to run it for a few minutes and then I'm gonna do another leak search just to be 100% sure. I wanna let the system build up some pressure. 
run for a minute, let the fan motors move some stagnant air around, and then we'll do another leak search, like I said. All right, still kind of zeroing out. Let's go in here, have a look around this TXV again. Yeah, nothing, nothing. Yeah, these things, this thing is very like sensitive. If you shake it, now it's not gonna do it for me, but I don't know, this thing isn't my favorite leak detector. I typically always verify with the bubbles with this one, but um, I'd really like to get my hands on the sensor for the Stratus, the hydrocarbon sensor for the Stratus. But all right, we're gonna put this together and then watch it come down to temp. All right, things are looking good. I inputted the numbers into measure quick. We're in about a 20 degree evaporator coil, about 110 degree condensing temp. That doesn't seem too bad. Um, box is at about 44 degrees. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the gauges off and start assembling everything in here. I think we're gonna be good to go. All right, unit is down to temperature. Just about to satisfy. Nice and cold in here. They can start loading up their kegs. Pull my light out of there. And that's it, we're gonna give them the keys and tell them to keep an eye on it. I know there's gonna be a lot of feedback that I'm gonna get in the comments about this video. First and foremost, I wanna go ahead and address a few topics that I know people are gonna be triggered by, okay? Number one, Dan Foss TXVs. Dan Foss TXVs, according to Dan Foss literature, do not need to be protected. They do not need to be cooled. I don't care what their literature says, I'm still protecting it. In this situation, um, this particular TXV is a stainless steel TXV on the outside, but it's copper coated on the inside. They are notorious for leaking, okay? Ridiculously bad. Um, don't know if it's the manufacturers doing shoddy jobs or if the copper coating is just junk. I personally don't have very good experience and it doesn't matter what manufacturers installing these TXVs, there's always leaks and they're always at the same spot. It's right where the Silphos is supposed to bond with the copper coating and they constantly leak, okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and start silver soldering all of them in from this point forward. Uh, I've done it for a bit now and I've been talking to my guys about it and it's just gonna be easier. Just flux it up with some stay sill flux and put some 56% silver solder on it and it's not gonna be a problem, okay? Um, next thing is that, you know, uh, using heat blocking compounds, they do work good. Oftentimes, I'm a little bit hesitant to use them on very, very small components because it can be really hard to get them in there enough. Now, this situation, I was able to get them in there to a point that you know I still could make a, a proper braze joint, but you don't want the heat blocking compound, the Viper wet rag to get near your braze joint so that way it potentially um, doesn't allow your braze joint to bond or to cure correctly okay so flowing nitrogen on systems like this is an absolute must this is an r290 system so in the very beginning i did a nitro sweep on the system i swept the entire system okay then you guys saw when i welded in the txv and i came all the way got done with that right and then i came over to the dryer and I was still getting flammable vapor coming out of the process stub as I was trying to unsweat it, okay? And that is because there's just little pockets of vapor in there. That's why it's so important when you're working on R290 systems to make sure that you are sweeping the system and still be prepared for a flame out, okay? Now you saw it was just a tiny bit of vapor left in the system. So inevitably as the nitrogen was pushing through, it was kind of probably concentrating it all and pushing it right at that outlet and it was igniting, but then it slowly tapered off and went away, right? Again, I can't stress how important it is, right? R290 is unodorized, highly flammable propane refrigerant. You cannot smell it, okay? So that is why it is so imperative that we sweep the system and always cover your butt when you're working on these things. Have fire extinguishers, have wet towels. Make sure that there's nothing around you that could be um, you know, causing issues that could ignite uh, you don't want to be brazing when you've got customers in, in you know, in the the area. Uh, that's the last thing I need is for customers to be sitting at the bar top just watching me what I'm doing, and then there's a flame out, and you know, you don't want that kind of stuff. So, um, as a business owner, I make it, uh, you know, my 
standard routine or whatever that, you know, if this needs to be repaired, it's not happening in front of the customers. It's just not. We don't need to make a scene. You know, if there was a small fire or something like that, we don't need customers freaking out. So just don't be working on those systems in front of the customers, especially at a bar top like that. I know the restaurant wants it done, but your company needs to stand up and say, no, this is not going to work. You know, we don't need to be creating bigger issues. At least that's the way that I operate, right? Um, when I'm approaching projects like this, when I'm getting ready to do things, I always have that pessimist inside of me, right? That's constantly thinking if it can happen, it will happen. Okay. So always be prepared for the worst. Now, here's the thing. If you prepare for the worst and it doesn't happen, it's all good. But if you don't prepare for the worst and then the worst happens, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So always prepare for the worst. Always think, hey, this region is going to catch on fire. Hey, there's going to be a flame out where I'm working. So have wet towels. Be ready for that, right? Just be prepared. Follow the whole Cub Scout motto, right? All that stuff. Just be prepared, right? Get your little Weeblos thing going on, right? Um, oh God, that was like a blast from the past, huh? Gee, many Christmas. Huh. I just had like a lapse down memory lane of being a Weeblos. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, but... Yeah, just always be prepared, okay? Next thing, when you are working on R290 systems, I highly encourage you, again, when I was out there the first day, I was using my brain, right? I wasn't just being a lemming. I wasn't just coming out and just being like, ooh, no gas, ooh, you know, whatever. Just pay attention, right? In this situation, um, I found a leak, and the system was still kind of working, but I can't in good conscience leave it operating because it's going to be leaking out that refrigerant. And furthermore, I vented the remaining refrigerant out of the system because I got to thinking, okay, as I was moving it around, doing the leak search, that leak got bigger. I could physic or I could actually hear it as I was getting finishing up. I could hear it leaking out at the TXV. And it's like, okay, then I'm looking around inside that box with all the doors shut and all the little electric booster motors because the evaporator fan motor wasn't running, but all the little booster motors that were blowing the air into the uh, tap lines and everything, and they had transfer fans and everything, they were all still running. So what are the odds? It's, it's very slim, but what are the odds that that leak is going to leak out and it's going to pressurize the box and then there's going to be something bad that can happen because of a fan motor or something like that, right? So always cover your butt. Think about that stuff. You got to look at the big picture. Okay. Now, next thing, OEM parts. When it comes to these regions, I highly suggest that you always use OEM parts. Do everything you can to cover your butt, right? I know that a lot of OEM parts, they don't work very well. And sometimes you can get aftermarket parts that work just as good or better. But again, like I kind of mentioned in the video, in a situation like this, right, if something bad happened, if there was a fire, an explosion or something like that, right, which is very, very unlikely, but again, prepare for the worst kind of a thing, right? Let the pessimist in you out, okay? If there was a fire, lawyers are going to get involved, right? Insurance companies are getting involved. And what you don't know is that just because you have liability insurance doesn't, you know, the insurance company is going to do everything to not pay out on that claim, right? Right. So my insurance company is going to do everything to prove that it was someone else's fault and vice versa on the other side, their insurance company is going to do everything they can to prove that it wasn't their fault. So that way they don't have to pay out on that claim. So don't give them fuel. Don't add fuel to the fire. Go back in with OEM components. And I'm talking, even if you have to change a dang power cord on the box, put an OEM power cord. Don't give the lawyers, don't give the insurance companies any fuel to the add to the fire, right? Always cover your butt, use the OEM parts. That's just the sad truth of how this works. You got to stick with the OEM stuff just to cover your butt, okay? Um, again, be careful, be safe. If you work on these systems, it's really no big deal, right? You can see that I'm working on it. There's a little flame out. It's, I'm not being panicked. It's just, eh, you know, it's just one of those things. You're just being prepared. Again, because I'm the type of person that thinks through this and I think of the situations and I can look at something and I could like just my brain starts going doo, 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 analyzing everything. Right. And I'm looking at it going, OK, so, you know, this potentially. So I'm ready when things happen. Right. So just be careful. It really isn't a big deal. I know a lot of people are making it out to be a big deal. It's not. It's just another refrigeration system. We just need to follow proper practices and I'm talking just basic proper practices, okay? Just make sure. 
double triple check for leaks you know in this situation in this video i was the electronic leak detector was still getting hit around the txv after i was all done and i'm like i got in there with soap bubbles there's no leaks it passed a pressure test it passed a dk test with the vacuum like there's no leaks but i still went and checked it three times i turned the system on moved some air around then went back to the txv to look again okay so it's not so it was probably just some refrigerant stuck somewhere inside there, a little pocket or something who knows, right? I really appreciate you making it to the end of the video. Thank you so very much. If you haven't already, uh, check out the uh, website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available on the website. We have regular hats. We have dad hats. We have flat bill hats, beanies, sweaters, t-shirts, all that good stuff. Great way to help support the channel. I try not to step on the merch too much to bring the prices up. I try to keep it down. For the most part, I've got about $5 profit in every item just to try to kind of help myself out. So I'm not trying to make a million dollars off this or anything, okay? Um, with uh, a couple other ways to help support the channel if you're interested in doing so, uh, one of the really cool ways is if you go to truetechtools.com and check out their website. If you see any tools that I use in my videos, just search for those tools on their website. If you use my offer code, big picture, one word, on checkout at True Tech Tools, um, what happens is on almost all of the items on their website, there's a few things it doesn't apply to, but almost all the items on their website, you get an 8% discount at checkout if you use my offer code. Again, big picture, one word. And then when you get that discount, I get a small commission and it's another great way to help support the channel, okay? Uh, last but not least, if you're interested in supporting the channel via PayPal, Patreon, or YouTube channel memberships, there's a link in the show notes of this video. But guess what? The easiest way to support this channel, I say this all the time, is literally just watch the videos from beginning to end. That's it, that's the easiest way, okay? I really, really appreciate you. Thank you so very much. Leave me some feedback down in the comments and uh, we will catch you on the next one.